And today, we're going to study about 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. 12-year-old Jesus. And so, isn't that interesting to think about that? You know, uh, when you think about uh, uh, 12-year-old Jesus, it's a Bible story that I think, for me, I have, um, you know, I've kind of not preached on it very often. Because maybe we think of it as a story that's kind of especially helpful for kids. But wow, I found some stuff in there for us as adults and for kids too that is really, really awesome. So I'm excited about sharing it with you. So today we're going to be studying from Luke chapter 2. But uh, Luke chapter 2, the location of that story in Luke chapter 2 may be one of the reasons why we don't study it very often. Because Luke chapter 2 has the Christmas story. And it's just, Luke chapter 2 is just filled with the, the Christmas story. And it's an awesome experience to, to read that, to study that. But, you know, we kind of stop before we get to, uh, we're kind of done with Luke chapter 2 before we ever get to that account of Jesus in the temple. So remember that the Gospel of Luke is written by Luke to a friend. And his friend's name is Theophilus. And Luke says some things to his friend in those introductory verses in chapter 1. For example, Luke says, I have carefully investigated everything about the life of Jesus. So what is Luke doing? He's going and talking to people about the experiences they had with Christ. And especially, we know from a lot of different things that he records, Luke is talking to Mary. So remember those verses you've read where it says, Mary treasured the things up in her heart. Remember those verses you've read that? Well, the, what that is saying is that, hey, there's a time when she treasured these things up and then she told them to Luke and then Luke recorded them in his gospel. So in verse 4, he tells Theophilus why he wants to teach him these things. He says, I want you to know for a certainty the things you've been instructed. So Luke is going to tell Theophilus about Jesus from the birth all the way to the, to the resurrection. And he wants Theophilus to get this complete, uh, this complete picture. And so Luke chapter 1 begins with the angel Gabriel showing up to a man named Zechariah. He's the father of John, the one who paved the way for Christ. And then we have the angel Gabriel come into the home of Mary and making this announcement to Mary. And then Mary visits Elizabeth and, and Elizabeth is the mother of John, the one who paved the way. And then John is born. And then in Luke chapter 2, Christ is born. And we have the incredible story of the shepherds. But then what happens is really interesting. When, when he tells the story of the birth and the shepherds come to, to uh, rejoice and celebrate in the birth of Christ, then they go to the temple and they encounter a guy whose name was, say it out loud, what's the, na the guy's name they encounter in the temple on the eighth day? Simeon. I heard somebody say, yes, Simeon. The guy's name is Simeon. Now, the Bible says about Simeon two things. He's righteous and he's devout. When it says he's devout, that means that Simeon is a guy who lives according to the Jewish customs and according to the Jewish law. Well, Mary and Joseph goes in, uh, go into the temple, and in verse 26, it says, It had been revealed to him, to Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. So you get the picture? Here's an old man, and the Holy Spirit revealed to him, Simeon, before you die, you're going to see with your own eyes the Messiah who's going uh, to be born. Then the Bible says the Holy Spirit uses the word guided. The Holy Spirit guided Simeon into the temple on that day, and the parents, uh, they, they're called the parents, Mary and Joseph, uh, of Jesus, they bring Jesus in, and the Bible says Simeon took him up in his arms and he praised God. And here's what, uh, here's what Simeon said. Simeon said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace as you promised. So he's praying to the Lord. He says, Now, God, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You get that picture? Mary and Joseph walk in for just what is to be a normal eighth day religious rite that's going to take place with their son and when they walk into the temple this old man holds the baby and he says my eyes have seen your salvation you prepared it in the presence of all peoples he's a light of revelation to the gentiles and glory to your people in israel you see the power of what's happening and can you imagine mary and joseph experiencing that and hearing that then the bible says his father and mother were amazed 
at what were being said about Jesus. Yeah, boy, that's an understatement, isn't it? Now, I, I know they, they've, they've had some clues along the way, but the angel saying that before he's born and Zechariah saying some things before he's born and, and uh, Elizabeth saying these things, those things are kind of hard to assimilate. They're kind of hard to take in and really make it a part of your life. Now, at eight days old, they go into the temple and this guy named Simeon says, this child, he's the, he's the light. This child is the Messiah. No question what he was saying. And then the Bible says right on the heels of that, there was a woman there. What was her name? Say it out loud. Anna. You're talking quietly today. You're being so, so polite. Anna. She's a prophetess. And it's a little hard to tell the way the Bible words it, whether she's 80 years old and has been a widow for a long time or whether she actually has been a widow for 84 years. It's a little hard to tell the way the, the, way the sentence is structured, but she's a very old woman. She hangs out at the temple all the time. She serves God in the daytime at the temple. She serves God in the nighttime at the temple. She is fasting and praying. And verse 38 says, at that very moment, that moment when Simeon is holding this baby and he's telling uh, Mary and Joseph what the Lord's revealed to him, he's telling them that this baby is the Messiah. At that very moment, she came up and she began to thank God and to speak about him, about Jesus, to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. You see, Mary and Joseph, they've got a kind of a steep learning curve. Yeah, I know I had those nighttime visits from the angel. I know our cousins, Zachariah and Elizabeth, said some things. But now all these people are saying, this child is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. Now, remember, Luke writes this to a friend. Why all these details? He wants Theophilus to know something about Jesus. He wants Theophilus to understand with a certainty what's going on with Jesus. This baby is all God and he is all man. And Mary and Joseph are amazed. So Luke gives us a little snapshot, just a little glimpse of one of their learning experiences. And it happens at the age of 12 for uh, Jesus, when Jesus is 12 years old. So now 12 years have passed since the Christmas story 12 years since Simeon and Anna were in the temple complex. Now look at verse 40 of Luke chapter 2. Luke says, The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom and God's grace on him. He grew up, he became strong, he's filled with wisdom and God's grace. Now we're going to come back to the part in between, but look down at verse 52. We just read verse 40, Luke 52, uh, chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and, and with people. So these statements about Jesus growing up, there's a certain normalcy to it. It just sounds really normal, doesn't it? He grows up. He grows up physically. He grows up in terms of his stature. He grows up mentally. He grows up emotionally. He grows in wisdom, so he grows and becomes strong. Back up in verse 40. Look at verse 41. Every year, his parents travel to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now, they lived in Nazareth, didn't they? And every year, they made this journey on foot from Nazareth to Jerusalem. And the reason they made the trip was to participate in the Passover. And the Passover wasn't just one thing. It was a Passover festival. So it was a multi-day event. So they go to participate in the Passover. Verse 42. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. So it was the custom that people who were devout Jews would go to, this, uh, to, to Jerusalem, to the temple complex, and they would celebrate the Passover. Now, what about him being 12 years old? That 12-year-old birthday is a very significant thing, that 12th year, because this is the year, the last year of preparation before he would become bar mitzvah. Now, bar mitzvah means son of the commandment. So it's the last year of preparation before he becomes uh, a full participant in synagogue and in things that happen in the temple at the end of his 12th year, beginning of his 13th year, he becomes a man in terms of the law and his spiritual experience. 
And one writer I read this week put it this way. This is the last year of preparation before he takes on the yoke of the law. He becomes a son of the commandment. And now he'd be responsible for knowing and keeping all of that law. So now look with me at verse 43. After those days were over, so they, they completed the Passover festival. After those days was over, were over, after, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Now we need to, we need to talk about that a little bit. Because let me tell you, things have changed a little bit in the last couple thousand years. In fact, Things have changed since I was a kid. I was just thinking about this this week, you know, and when I was 12 years old, I don't think it would have been at all unusual for me to disappear for an entire day and my parents to have no idea where I was. Now, I say no idea. They knew that I was in the community someplace, you know, in that, in that neighborhood that we lived in. Now, the reason I tell you that, I don't want you to think that Mary and Joseph are bad parents because that's simply not, that's not the case. It, First of all, they're traveling in a group, and this group of people are friends and relatives. He makes that clear in, I think, the next verse. So they're traveling with this group of friends and relatives, and they travel this multi-day, on-foot trip all the way to Jerusalem. They do things together. They probably stay together in some kind of a camp or some relative's home, and then they start the journey back, and the day ends, and they get to the end of the day, and they realize, wait a minute, we're where's Jesus? And they begin to realize that, that they really don't know where their son is. So they go talk. Let, let's look at that next, uh, next verse. I think it's verse 44. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. So this, this travel party has relatives in it. Got aunts and uncles, I guess, or something like that. Cousins. And this travel party has friends and they've been together for this whole Passover festival event. So I just don't want you to think that Mary and Joseph are bad guys for not knowing where, you know, it's not like they could just pick up a cell phone and, and check in. So they didn't know where Jesus was. And as the story unfolds, I don't want you to think that Jesus is being a disobedient son because he's not. Let's, let's look at verse 45. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple complex. Pause right there for a moment. So three days. I think the three days we're talking about, I don't think they're searching for three days in Jerusalem. I think there's one day they're traveling away from Jerusalem. There's one day they're traveling back to Jerusalem. And then there's one day they're searching for him. So that's the three days that I think, that I think we're thinking about. Now, I know you're thinking, is Jesus sitting there day and night talking to these guys. No, I don't think so. I think, I think he had uh, uh, some kind of friend or relatives that he was staying with, that the whole group was staying with, and I think he went there at night. There's no way they would be able to communicate and say, hey, Jesus is okay. He's with us. You know, that, it, 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 there wasn't that kind of communication. All right, let's pick it up at verse 45. Um, well, we were in the middle of verse 46, weren't we? So they, they three days, they found him in the temple complex, and notice what he's doing. He's sitting among the teachers. He's listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. Now, th there's a thing happening here that involves questions and uh, answers. Uh, Darren and I were talking about this a few minutes ago, and Darren pointed out to me uh, uh, so, some things about this, and somebody else from the 9 o'clock service. You know, this, the teaching in that day was conversational it was a kind of thing where the teacher would ask a question and then a, a good student who was sitting in the class would say yes and talk about that and then say but what do you think about and maybe ask another question so what we have here is Jesus is listening and uh, Jesus is uh, uh, let's see uh, and and he's he's listening and he is asking but he also is a answering some questions so responding to questions now here's the place where here's the place where it kind of gets really grabs my attention maybe you think about this stuff too how does God ask questions is he just playing with them is he just using a teaching technique for that matter in verse 52 how does God 
grow in wisdom. How does Jesus, he's all God, grow in wisdom? We're going to think about that. We're going to talk about that a little bit. So he's asking questions, he's answering questions, he's listening. And verse 47 tells us, All those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and at his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Jesus' answer seems to show kind of a genuine surprise. He says, why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Now that phrase, in my father's house, can just as accurately be translated. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? In my father's house or about my father's business. Either is a good translation. But they did not understand what he said to them. Now let's pause here and, and learn a little bit about this. Um, Jesus is not being disrespectful. He's not being rebellious in any way. What Jesus is doing is he is um, walking through that, that moment, that mystery of being divine and human and how those divine and human natures live in one person. And he's teaching Mary and Joseph an important lesson. Did you notice that Mary said, your father and I, talking about adoptive father Joseph, and Jesus said, didn't you know I need to be in my father's house or about my father's business, speaking of the real uh, heavenly father. So he is pulling their understanding along in that. There's no hint of disobedience. There's no hint of rebellion, but they didn't understand it. So in verse 51, they went down, I mean, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. So he's respectful, he's age appropriate, he's obedient. But notice the last part of verse 51. His mother kept all these things in her heart, in her heart. And then Joseph, uh, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with people. Now let's learn some lessons about this. First lesson, really important. Jesus is totally, fully God. He is completely God. Totally fully, completely God. And he understands his role. Jesus knows this, and he's reminding Mary and Joseph of his heavenly father. Yeah, I need to be about my father's business. Now, he's obedient to adoptive father Joseph. He's respectful and age appropriate to him, but he knows that his real father is in heaven and that his father's business is being demonstrated, being shown there in the temple. Think about the ways in which the father's business are carried out in the temple. What's the business of the father? Well, the people came to worship, they came to pray, they came to give, but maybe most important of all, the temple is a place that demonstrates redemption. It demonstrates the forgiveness of sin. It demonstrates that God is tearing down the barriers between him and the people that he loves and making it possible for people who are separated from Him by sin to be with Him again. You get that? It's about redemption. And so everything in the temple points in that direction. The garments that the priest was wearing would point them toward and paint a picture of redemption, forgiveness of sin. Not only that, but the uh, laver where the priest washed his hands would be a demonstration of God's atonement, God's washing away of sins. The sacrifice were a picture of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus would provide. The Holy of Holies and the heavy curtain that separated the people from the Holy of Holies. That would be a place where they could see that God's presence was blocked off from them and the curtain needed to be torn away. So when Jesus says, don't you know I need to be about my Father's business? He's talking about the temple. He's talking about redemption and atonement and forgiveness of sin. Not only did Jesus understand his role, but he knows and he loves the law. He is completely absorbed in the law. And, and, and so uh, he is interested in that way beyond what uh, any other kid would be interested in that. And then, and this is really important, Jesus had a strong sense of his mission. He knew exactly what he was about, why he was there, what he was supposed to be doing. Did you notice in verse 49, he said, didn't you know that I had to be? It was, it was essential that I be in my father's house about my father's business. I had to do that. 
Now look at chapter 4, verse 43. Uh, well, or, or I'll just quote you a passage from it. In 443, Luke said that Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news. And then can I remind you of the story of Zacchaeus? Remember who Zacchaeus is? He's told in Luke chapter 19. And Zacchaeus is the guy who uh, climbs a tree so he could get a better look at Jesus. And remember what Jesus said to him? He said, Zacchaeus, come down because I must go to your house today. It's essential that I go to your home and tell you about the work that I'm my mission to redeem, to atone, to provide forgiveness of sin. I must do that today, that essential nature. It's best said in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus said, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and rise on the third day. So even at 12 years of age, Jesus has this sense of mission. He knows that he must live a sinless life. He must die to pay the debt for our sins. He must rise to give us eternal life. He knows that that is his mission, even at age 12. So Jesus is totally, fully God, but he's also totally, fully uh, man. Verse 40 says he grew up and he became strong. Verse 52 says he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature and he grew in favor. It sounds kind of normal, doesn't it? Sounds like what you would expect of any normal uh, child of that age. Jesus, think about this. He had to take his first step. He had to learn to walk. He had to fall in the process of learning to walk. Jesus had to say his first words. I mean, he didn't come out of the womb able to speak complete sentences. He had to learn to say his first word. And he had to learn to speak the language that his parents were teaching. One um, gospel, uh, uh, Bible writer, Paul, put it this way. He said that Jesus emptied himself. Let's take a look at that in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, it says Jesus existed in the form of God. He did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. You see how that applies to this? He's God. He could have said, okay, I don't want to learn how to walk and stumble and fall and crawl and all that stuff. I'm going to use the, God's, the God thing and just be walking already. He, he could have said, I, I don't want to have to learn how to talk. I'm God. I don't want to have to learn the, my first word. But look at, what, look at what Paul says he did. Instead, this is verse 7, instead he emptied himself and he assumed the form of a slave taking on the likeness of men and when he become as a man in his external form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross the two operative phrases are he emptied himself and he humbled himself he emptied himself and apparently he emptied himself of at least some of his omniscience I know that doesn't make sense. You can't empty yourself of some of something that is everything. I get it. But go with me here. This is hard to explain. This is a mystery, so you can give me better words later. Listen, listen to what Jesus said. In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, he's talking about end times, about the return of Christ. Jesus said, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, catch this next phrase, nor the Son, but only the Father in heaven knows the calendar for end times. So Jesus emptied himself of that knowledge of when Jesus would return, when Messiah would return. Get that? So there's some sense in which Jesus, he, the reason I mention that, he's not playing games. When we see him at 12 years of age and he's talking to the, the, the teachers and he's listening and he's answering, he asking questions and he's answering questions, He's not playing some theological game with them. And I don't think, as someone suggested, I don't think he's testing them either. I think what Jesus is doing is he's demonstrating so that, that people could see, look, I went through all the things that you go through. I went through all those things. I grew in wisdom. I emptied myself so that I could grow in wisdom. I grew in learning how to talk and learning how to walk. I experienced all the things that you experienced. You see, it's the only way that Jesus could really become one of us. He had to empty himself 
and grow up as one of us. He was totally fully God, but he was also totally fully man. And therefore, he is the perfect Savior. I found this passage in Hebrews chapter 2 that is absolutely incredible. It's Hebrews chapter 2 beginning at verse 14, and it is an amazing passage. I would encourage you to memorize the last verse we look at in just a moment, but look at verse 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, who are the children? Well, he's talking about us. He's talking about descendants of Abraham, but spiritual descendants of Abraham includes us. The children have flesh and blood in common. We have that in common, don't we? All of us are flesh and blood. Since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might. Now, Jesus is the author of Hebrews is going to give us four incredible blessings that come to us as a result of the incarnation. Four incredible blessings that we have because Jesus became flesh and blood. You get that? So here's the first incredible blessing that comes to us because Jesus in flesh is, is flesh and blood. He can destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil. Satan has a trump card, doesn't he? That he can always say, yeah, it's death. That's the thing that takes away hope. That's the thing that takes away uh, our, our relationships. Jesus conquered Satan, and he conquered Satan's ability to, to, to have the power of death. He destroyed the one holding the power of death. Now, the second great blessing he gives us is he freed us who were held in slavery in all of our lives by the fear of death. So what does Jesus do for us? He frees us from the fear of death. He frees us from slavery to the fear of death. As a pastor, I've had way too many times at the side of someone who was moving from this life, who was dying, moving this life into the next, way too many times. And I'm telling you guys, there's a huge difference in the way Christians die and the way unbelievers die. Why? Because Jesus, in becoming one of us, becoming flesh and blood, what he has done is he has taken away the fear of death. He's freed us from slavery to the fear of death. The third thing he's done is down in verse 17. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers in every way. He had to become flesh and blood. He had to be like us in every way. Why? so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation or to provide us atonement. He's talking about the forgiveness of sin. So the third great blessing God has given us in his becoming a person is incarnation. The third great blessing is that he has become a high priest, a mediator, a connection between us and the Father. And he has done that in a merciful and faithful way. That's why Jesus can look at you and say, look, I love you so much. I know what you're going through. I've been through it too. He can only say that because he's flesh and blood. Look at the last wonderful blessing he gives us in verse 18. And this is the verse I would encourage you to memorize. For since he himself was tested and suffered, he is able to help those who are tested. Because Jesus became flesh and blood, because he became one of us, it's called the incarnation. Because Jesus became one of us, He is able to help us when we're tested. Now, when you see the word tempted or tested, don't think of just temptation to sin. It's more than that. It's also going through times when you go through really tough moments, when you go through hard times in your life. He's been tested in those ways too. So I don't know what you're going through today, but I know that Jesus has been through it as well. He knows and understands what you're going through. He's been through pain and loneliness and rejection. He's been through sadness and temptation. He's been through grief. grief. He's been through hopelessness. We're talking about a mystery here. and This is the so what to today's message. Jesus, because he became one of us and he conquered death and he rose from the dead, Jesus does two incredible things. He is fully able to provide you forgiveness of sin. But here's the wow, amazing, astonishing good news. Because he became one of us. Because he was tested and tempted and suffered in all the ways that we're tested and tempted and we suffer. Because of that, he can walk through us 
with us through every season of life. Every season of life. Let me lead us in a prayer, but before we pray, let me just say, if you need to pray with someone about uh, what you're going through, it would be a great pleasure, a great privilege to pray with you. There will be some people here at the front, somebody at the prayer wall. If you just need to, to just go to one of those people during the song or after this song, feel free to do that. If you need to talk with someone about how you can be sure that you know Jesus in that personal way so that He's walking with you through every moment of life, you can come and talk with us about that. It would be a great pleasure to help you to make that decision so that you know Jesus is right there with you every step of the way. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for the privilege to study and dig into the Word today. I thank you for the opportunity that we've had today just to drill down and really find truth in the Scripture and the Word of God. And God, I know that there are people in this room facing all kinds of incredibly difficult things. And so I pray, Lord, that today uh, everyone in this room would just know that you're walking with them. And Lord, if they're not sure of that, I pray they'd just come and let us pray with them so they can be sure that you're walking with them every step of the way, no matter what they're going through today, you're right there with them. We pray it in Jesus' name.